Welcome to my in-depth analysis on the episode Shut Up and Dance. Hopefully when leaving this video, you'll have a more nihilistic and dour view on humanity. So let's get started. In Shut Up and Dance, we observe Kenny. Oh wait, before we begin, I think it's important to note that there will be spoilers ahead for this episode, obviously, and there's gonna be spoilers for Black Mirror seasons one through three. Okay, now we're good. In Shut Up and Dance, we observe Kenny, a supposed normal teenager who works all day as a busboy and then comes home to find that his sister tried to put on this film thing. What film thing? This film thing that supposedly allows you to illegally stream movies. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. But what it does do is give you a bunch of viruses. Kenny's sister isn't the most knowledgeable person when it comes to illegally streaming or downloading movies on her brother's computer, especially because she already ruined her own laptop when attempting to do this very thing. And she's even using a website that claims they're able to stream a movie in 6K in the year 2016. Anyway, this results in Kenny's computer contracting malware. Oh, also, when looking at Kenny's laptop on the front right here, you can see a sticker that appears to be the Blue Bear Waldo from the episode The Waldo Moment. You remember, the most underrated episode of Black Mirror. I will die on this hill. So in order to get rid of this good old malware, Kenny downloads some free malware removal software, which comes with a little feature that allows a group of hackers to access Kenny's computer. It's not an ideal feature. The hackers end up using Kenny's camera to record him doing, uh, or pleasuring, or uh, treating himself to some images on the dark web. Kenny is going to pound town. In the end, it's revealed that Kenny liked kids a little too much. In fact, he liked them so much that he would do stuff like look at illegal photographs of them. It's interesting that the malware removal software that gives him the virus is named Shrive, meaning to hear the confession of and to assign penance to. Because Shrive allows the hackers to learn about the sins Kenny is committing and gives them enough dirt on Kenny so that they can assign tasks to him so he can punish himself. Now knowing what kind of photos Kenny was looking at completely changes how you'd view this opening scene where he happily returns the toy to the little girl, especially how he's not breaking eye contact with her. And this wave, oh my goodness, everything is so much more disturbing now. Let's go over some subtleties that were hinting at this reveal because why not? For example, Kenny had this stutter throughout the entire episode, but the only people he didn't stutter around were his mom, his sister, and the little girl. And when Kenny was waving goodbye to the little girl, it's the only time during the entire episode that we see a truly happy and energetic smile on Kenny's face. There's also that moment where Kenny is seen lingering on these crayon drawings that were left behind by some random family. The drawing paper coincidentally has a little piggy on it to remind you and I that the ending of the national anthem was a thing and that it happened. Oh, and Kenny was suspiciously protective over his laptop to the point where he put a lock on his door after his sister took his computer from him just one time. When Hector and Kenny are walking out of the hotel, the camera lingers on some random kid that they're passing by. Before the twist of the episode is revealed, we think that this kid might be one of the hackers. But looking back, I think it's just another hint at Kenny's true nature. Another creepy detail is how when you look at Kenny's emails over here, you can see that a guy named P is wanting to sell Kenny a camera. Kenny loved looking at bad pictures, so it's safe to assume that his desires would eventually lead to him taking action beyond the screen, as in going out in the world and taking his own pictures. Hence why there's a camera for sale email in his emails. Kenny was on this path of becoming a monster, because he didn't even think through what he was doing until he was caught doing it. He even deludes himself into thinking that everything he was doing was okay. Because the entire episode, he's just telling Hector, this guy, and himself that he just looked at some photos. Trying to convince himself that the illegal photos he was caught looking at were just as normal as the photos he'd received from his friends and family. At the end of Shut Up and Dance, all the characters who were activated were sent a little image of a troll face. I know for a fact that the audience's reaction was either like, whoa, got him, or they just cringed. There is no in-between. For anyone who doesn't know what a troll face is or wasn't on the internet 12 years ago, a troll face is an OG meme, specifically a rage comic character that's representative of someone who posts to a chat room, forum, thread, or any social media app with the intent of provoking the reader into having this negative emotional response. Quick history lesson on troll face, because once again, 
why not? Trollface was first posted on DVR on September 19th, 2008 by Carlos Ramirez. He included a troll face in a webcomic about his outrage with useless trolling on 4chan's video games board. I've always felt that the use of troll face was a hint at who the hackers were. That it wasn't just one hacker, but a collective group of anonymous individuals on the internet. A group resembling something like Anonymous, which is a decentralized hacktivist group that originated on, you guessed it, 4chan. Anonymous has done a bunch of stuff. To go slightly more in depth than that, Anonymous is known for hacking into and revealing the information of organizations like the Westboro Baptist Church, as well as messing with the Church of Scientology. But the main reason I'm bringing up Anonymous is not because of the use of Trollface, but because Anonymous is responsible for something called Operation Darknet. During this operation, they claim to have been successful at briefly shutting down 40 websites that were trading images that Kenny would just love to see. In my head, I've always imagined the hackers of Shut Up and Dance to not be anonymous, but to be something like anonymous. When Hector pulls the car up to the bank after disappearing for a hot minute, he claims that there was some guy standing there on his phone freaking him out. That guy and the kid in the lobby could have been working for the hackers and frequently giving them updates. But the scary part is, you'd have no way of ever knowing, as literally anyone could be part of the group of hackers. That's kind of the fun part. And these are just two of your average, non-tech-savvy people people who are at the mercy of technology that they don't fully understand. But the fact that the hackers had each activated person take a photo of the other activated person to confirm that they met up with the right activated person leads me to believe that the hackers did not have eyes everywhere. It appears that they pulled this off by using just text messages, GPS, and webcams, with no other help in the real world. In an interview with GQ, Alex Lothar, who plays Kenny, went on to say that he was a huge fan of Black Mirror, and particularly liked the episode White Bear, another episode that's thematically very similar to Shut Up and Dance, as both episodes explore how the public can use modern day technology to take justice into their own hands. I mean, Black Mirror has always been a show that mainly focuses on modern or future technology that should be used for widespread good, but good old humans mishandle it and manipulate it to do some bad things. Except in you. You're perfect. With that said, Shut Up and Dance also shares a lot of similar themes with the National Anthem and Hated in the Nation. You know, other episodes of Black Mirror. And a quick recap for those who haven't watched the show in a bit, just because it's been a hot minute since we got a new season. The National Anthem follows the story of Prime Minister Michael Callow, who is put in a pretty awkward situation where Princess Susanna has been kidnapped, and the only way to set her free is if Callow f***s a pig by 4pm that day. Doing all this live on national television, in front of everyone. At first, the majority of people were like, nah, don't do it, that's just ridiculous. But then a shift in public opinion pressures the Prime Minister into going through with the indecent act. Like, he actually the pig. White Bear focuses on a society that has created a justice park to punish a woman named Victoria Scalane after she used her smartphone to film her fiancé killing a girl named Jemima Sykes. In this justice park, the civilians are participating in a large-scale reenactment of Victoria's crime, but instead of Jemima Sykes getting filmed and tortured, it's Victoria. The park is meant to make it a nice day for a family outing, with the overall goal of having fun and enjoying themselves while torturing a criminal. Now let's go over to Hated in the Nation. A story where hacker Garrett Skulls hacks into synthetic bees to kill an individual with the highest amount of hashtag death to posts made about them that day on social media, letting the public decide which person will die each day. In some cases, the public is just offing people for having unpopular opinions. So why am I bringing up all these episodes? Don't worry. I'm getting to it. As you probably know by now, the episode titled Shut Up and Dance does not involve the art of dance or walk the moon or any kind of dance party. In fact, it's kind of like the opposite of a dance party. In Shut Up and Dance, you're dealing with vigilante justice. This faceless online group is wanting to watch the bad people suffer for the same reason people attended the White Bear Justice Park, or why people posted hashtag death too. It's pure schadenfreude, but more sadistic. Everyone at the White Bear Justice Park reenacted Victoria's crime. They had fake killers chase her throughout the park, while everyone else just watched and recorded her on their smartphones. The park goers and employees end up getting so lost in the punishment that they basically 
become the person they wanted to punish. And this, I'm gonna bring that up in a second, so just remember that I said that. You know what they say, if a society is a reflection of its justice system, then, you know, they're really not in good shape. When it came to reading the comments on my analysis of White Bear, I've seen a fair amount of people say that they support the idea of a White Bear Justice Park, and would be fine with implementing something like that within our society, and saying stuff like, Victoria got off easy. So I really don't know why I was surprised when I saw comments claiming that the hackers and Shut Up and Dance are the heroes. But to be fair, I mean, I can understand and see why people would come to that conclusion. And I can see myself coming to that conclusion. But I'm just gonna go ahead and make the argument that the hackers are just not the good guys. But my answer is gonna be a little long, so bear with me. What's that one phrase again? Oh yeah, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Which is a phrase I wholeheartedly disagree with and think it's probably the dumbest thing in the world. I have no doubt that Georgina over here was rightfully accused of sending those emails. So hey, it's a good reason to allow vigilantes to illegally obtain information on an entire company, right? Same thing with how they hacked into Kenny's laptop to reveal his dark, sick nature, right? I don't know. I'm not here to supply definitive answers. With my videos, I'm not setting out to enforce my own political ideologies or opinions, but to do what Black Mirror does best and contribute more to intellectual discussions surrounding certain complicated issues within our modern day society. And that's what I love about Shut Up and Dance is how it expands on the ideas that were brought forth by White Bear and Hated in the Nation. The only way these hackers were able to obtain dirt on the criminals was compromising the security of everyone else. But the hackers aren't alone, their strategy is kind of used by big tech companies and government organizations. Protection over you, me, and everyone else's privacy is an ongoing issue within our society. Most of our private information is exploited on a daily bay, and it's only getting worse. So with all the comments that I received about Shut Up and Dance, it brought up the question, is the unethical collection and exploitation of private information of the majority justified by the need to pursue the law-breaking minority, as in people like Kenny? That is one of the most important questions this episode raises for me. Like, what's the true cause? of allowing our society to condone these large-scale entities unethically observing those who aren't suspected of unethical behavior in order to find someone who may be suspected of unethical behavior. It's a justified pursuit, but where do you draw the line? Anyone could have downloaded that link, including people like Kenny's sister trying to fix their computer. So the hackers would have to sort through people like her in order to get to people like Kenny. See how it gets more gray? In order to gain access to Georgina's private emails, the hackers had to infiltrate the entire company exposing everyone else's information. The reason the hackers must have picked her was because she was the first one caught doing something bad, meaning the hackers were probably spying on a bunch of random innocent people in order to get to one bad person. When the troll face happening happened, the motorcycle guy was just getting yelled at by his family, so it's safe to assume that he did something more similar to what Hector did. He's still standing there without getting arrested, meaning it's definitely not as bad as what Kenny did. <laughs> so given all the information we have, other than than Kenny and his friend, everyone was doing something immoral, not illegal. You don't have to be looking at Kenny's favorite pictures or committing an actual crime to be coerced into this sick game orchestrated by the hackers, reinforcing the fact that it could be anyone, since humans are inherently fallible and everyone has secrets that they entrust onto their devices. When the hackers or other entities are conducting an unwarranted search on someone's private emails, texts, calls, etc., it may be really difficult for them to decode sarcasm or facetious marks. Or let's say when the hackers are doing their eavesdropping, they can distinguish sarcasm from serious, but then decide to take something out of context that does not reflect the person's actual beliefs to then use against them. This hypothetical could be applied to any conversation that the public was just not meant to see. All it takes is one misinterpretation to ruin someone's life. In order to better understand what I'm saying, just google the phrase Reddit witch hunt. Let me put it this way, so assuming that the hackers are adults, which they most likely are, by collecting every evidence on teenage Kenny, they almost just committed a similar crime to the one they're punishing Kenny for. Kenny is 19 years old, so they get off the hook for that felony. Okay, but here's where it gets dicey, because the hackers would have to send everyone the footage of Kenny doing his thing, as well as a screen recording of what Kenny was looking at while he was doing his thing. Meaning the hackers are not only illegally recording Kenny's activity, but also illegally distributing the stuff that Kenny was looking at, as Kenny's mom calmly confirms in the most endearing phone call. Yes. Claiming that she's seen the video, his sister's seen the video, all of his sister's friends saw the video, God saw the video. Quick side note, I thought it was kind of interesting how the episode before Shut Up and Dance was playtest. In playtest, Cooper's main issue was that he didn't pick up the call from his mom, but
But in Kenny's case, it was that he did. So now that the hackers are brought down to a level closer to Kenny's, let's keep going. Kenny is given a cake, the same way that Joe Powers is given a cake in Hit It In The Nation. Kenny got his cake from a group of hackers trying to ruin his life. And Powers got her cake from a group of moms in Liza's message board trying to ruin her life. These parallels show us that the hackers are, in a sense, no different from Liza crowdsourcing the money to send Powers that hate cake, solidifying the notion that this is not justice, but people doing it for their own enjoyment. When the hackers have Kenny fight the other guy to the point where one of them is no longer alive, they film the cage match with the drone like it's something on pay-per-view. This is the moment I got massive white bear flashbacks, with the whole putting someone through torture and then filming it for their enjoyment. The hackers force Kenny to rob a bank, a punishment that was specifically tailored for him, mainly because the first thing that Kenny did was ask the hackers if they wanted money. Also, the hat and glasses that they made Kenny wear made him look less like a bank robber and more like a, you know. They set up Kenny with Hector because they knew that Hector could drive a car and they knew Kenny wouldn't be able to. Based on this knowledge, the hackers intentionally gave Kenny a location that was 57 minutes away by bike, then told him, be there in 45 minutes or they leak the video. They set up obstacles like putting no fuel in the car and giving Kenny no time to get to his next destination because it's making the activated people more stressed out and inducing fear, further tormenting them in a subtle way because shut up and dance. There's also that moment where Kenny and Hector stop at the gas station and Hector tells Kenny that his pin is 3109. Then when Kenny goes into the gas station to pay at the register, the total amount owed is 31.89. Just one number off from the pin. The hackers most likely didn't plan for that, but if they did, oh my ego waffles, they, they're just, they're killing it. The hackers literally had someone rob a bank. I know there were no bullets in Kenny's weapon, but come on, there were so many innocent people involved and things could have went south real fast. Blackmail is also a felony, people, so we're just gonna go ahead and add that to the list of felonies the hackers are committing. The point is, do you still think the hackers are the good guys? But then wait one just a second. If the hackers are the bad guys, then who are the good guys of the episode? The answer would be no one. It's a really good thing to remember that no one here is defending Kenny doing his favorite thing, the CEO sending those emails, or Hector cheating on his wife, and so on. These are all scenarios that the majority of us can agree are really bad. And when people want to pursue their own form of justice, they could get carried away thinking that they're so in the right for pursuing someone who's so in the wrong, deluding themselves into believing that they can get away with a lot because it's for a good cause, turning an ethical pursuit into something really unethical really fast. This is something that's portrayed throughout Black Mirror, especially in the episodes that I just summarized for you. It's why we see people posting hashtag death to, and why everyone was having a grand old time at the White Bear Justice Park, and why people got carried away with pressuring the Prime Minister into f that pig. Shut Up and Dance shares the same kind of story structure as White Bear, as our two lead protagonists don't know why people were watching them and putting them through their own personalized torture. Both Kenny and Victoria committed heinous crimes involving children, one recording a video of her fiancé killing Jemima Sykes and the other one looking at pictures of kids that he really just shouldn't be looking at. You know, both people who you and I would consider monsters, but they were made more human to us through our experience with them. When Kenny is told that he has to fight the other other guy who's guilty of the same sin, he pulls out the gun. But like Victoria's situation, the gun isn't loaded. At least not with anything lethal. Victoria is pushed to the point where she begs for death, but is denied it. Just like how Kenny tries to unalive himself out of the situation, but is denied that option as well. Okay, it's getting a little dour in here for some reason, so let's take a quick breather and talk about them Easter eggs. When Kenny has to rob the bank, we see that the bank is called National Allied Bank, the same bank that owned the ATM that Cooper tried to withdraw money from in the episode Playtest. When looking at the news article of the CEO in that email scandal of hers, you can see that the graphic artist of the show had a field day. Above the initial article, we see this headline claiming that Michael Callow is getting a divorce. You remember Michael Callow, the guy who f***ed a pig in the national anthem? Well, this article confirms that Michael Callow's marriage fell apart after his wife and the rest of the world watched him do that. In the same section, you can see that the talent show 15 Million Merits launches next week, referring to the talent show Hot Shop from the episode 15 Million Merits. To the right of all of that is a little advertisement for cookies from the episode White Christmas. In the featured articles, you can see more of Michael Callow getting divorced and the latest update on the Victoria Scalane trial, referring to the trial Victoria Scalane 
Chaplain went through after the death of Jemima Sykes. She was found guilty during this trial and then put into the White Bear Justice Park. Okay, Bryce, we get it. Enough of the Easter eggs, man. Jeez. Now, I'm just gonna want to take some time to address the awkward cage match in the room. Specifically trying to answer the question, how in the heck did Kenny win the fight against the other guy? This guy was taller, he weighed more, and he was just overall a bigger dude. You could be like me and just accept it as part of the narrative and continue on with your life. But if you're not, there's only like two reasonable explanations that I can think of. The first and least likely would be the fact that there could have been a rock somewhere, like a really pointy rock, and the other guy just ended up falling on it. But then the second reason, the one that we're all here for, would be that Kenny won the fight because he had a weapon and the other guy didn't. I'm assuming Kenny dropped the gun because it wasn't seen in his hand when he got tackled. But all Kenny had to do was find a way to pick up that weapon. Even though Kenny over here got victorious glained as there were no bullets in the gun, Kenny could still use the weapon to hit the guy with and knock him unconscious. Holding it by the barrel and using it as a blunt weapon can be pretty effective. Trust me, I've seen the movie Equilibrium. Hitting him with the handle could cause some severe fractures, so all Kenny had to do was get a few good hits on the other guy, and then boom! Problem solved. Well, except for the multiple felonies that are added to his multiple felonies. This song that plays at the end of the episode is called Exit Music for a Film by Radiohead from their album OK Computer, an album title that refers to embracing the future. It refers to being terrified of the future, of our future, of everyone else's. Exit Music was the song originally made to play at the end of Romeo and Juliet, the 1996 Baz Luhrmann film that's actually titled Romeo Plus Juliet, a film where the two characters on a lot themselves because they couldn't be together. Using some very colorful words, Hector claims that he would unalive himself if his kids were taken from him. Even the guy who Kenny ends up fighting claims that his life is over if the information about him leaks. And Kenny wanted to unalive himself before the fight even started. The last lyric we hear from Exit Music for a film before the credits roll and shut up and dance is Now We Are One, an everlasting peace. A reference to Romeo and Juliet meeting up in the afterlife, implying that Kenny and Hector are definitely gonna unalive themselves at some point. I think that was everything I had to say today about Shut Up and Dance, so thanks for watching.